Okay, we'll we'll get going. Um, again, welcome everyone to uh, this event, Voices from Larangar, an online symposium and book launch. Um, <clears throat> I want to just invite um, Nico Odysseus to say just a few words from our publisher, Shambhala Publications, and then I'll go over uh, what the schedule is and begin introducing our first panel. Thanks, Holly. I am really happy to be here, and I'm so happy that Holly and the group of scholars behind Voices of Larangar, um, the book that we're talking about today, have brought forward the words of many of the extraordinary men and women from Serta or Larangar. And it's a pretty amazing time right now for those who are interested in the teachings of Kempo Jigme Punso Grimbache, the teachings of his students, some of whom are the second generation of leaders at Larangar, um, as well as all of those who are interested in the scholarly aspects of Larangar, like its historical relevance, its revitalization of Tibetan Buddhism and culture. Um, um, the cultural cross-pollination that happens there with, with um, Chinese and Tibetan and, and beyond. Um, and in particular, it's unique engagement with modernity, which is really the focus of this volume um, and this, this, uh, this panel or these panels today. Um, and while the institution of Larangar has been around for decades, until recently, there just wasn't that much available for English speakers scholarly or otherwise. There was um, this piece in Buddhism in contemporary Tibet that David Germano wrote um, a, almost a quarter century ago, which still I highly recommend um, because it captures a, a period when Kempo Jigme Punsuk was still alive. Um, it's published by University of California and it's um, a, a nice small volume with, with David's piece in there. Um, but happily over the last few years, there's been a flurry of books from this sort of second generation of teachers and leaders from Larangar cum culminating in the volume that we're talking about today. Um, there's a couple of really nice ones from Wisdom. There's a bunch from us with more in the way. And then there's several um, um, privately published things from some of the teachers there and just lots more coming out. So um, it's a really great time for those of us who are interested in, in Larangar. And it's not just the books, it's this whole second generation of teachers that's become such a presence around the world. Of course, Tibet and China, but throughout Asia, Europe and the Americas, um, there's, they're really making a huge impact. Uh, I think a lot of the people on, on this panel and attendees have gotten to know quite a number of the contributors to this volume and the leaders of Larangar um, from, because of their visits here. Um, to Europe and, and the Americas. And there are many of their Dharma brothers and sisters who have settled here outside of Tibet and China and are teaching. And now even some of their students are coming and teaching. So there's a lot going on. And, and there's also this whole other um, set of teachers who will not directly part of the cohort, cohort that was had a strong connect, but that was not part of the cohort of um, Kempo Jigpun's students they have a strong connection to Larangar, including, of course, Anam Tupt and Rinpoche, who we're fortunate enough to have with us today. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Holly. Okay, thank you, Nico. Wonderful. So as um, Nico was saying, this book that we're celebrating and discussing today, Voices from Larangar, Shaping Tibetan Buddhism for the 21st Century, is really um, the first publication to collect together um, translate and contextualize and showcase a whole group of prominent voices at um, Larangar or Larang Buddhist Academy. And the contributors to the book chose to introduce and translate speeches and writings by Larangar Kempos and Kenmos, male and female cleric scholars, um, that represent some of their innovative and at times controversial approaches to Buddhist engagement with animal rights, gender equity, and scientific inquiry. 
So these are some of the topics that we'll get to with the presenters today, especially in the second part of the symposium. So there will be two panels today. Uh, the first one is on Larangar, its impact and its founding figures. And that will be with special guests, Anam Tupton and David Germano, as well as anthology contributor, Antonio Toroni. And I'll moderate that. And the second panel will deal with the voices of the second generation at Larangar. And um, this will be moderated by my co-host, Michael Sheehy, and uh, include uh, Catherine Hardy, uh, Jeff Barstow, uh, Pematso, and Sarah Jacoby. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening, as well as our co-sponsors, the Tibet Himali Initiative and the UVA Tibet Center. Um, I encourage all of you to use speaker view um, during our panel so that you can be focused on the main presenter. And there will be a Q&A at the end of each section. And you'll notice that there's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen for this uh, webinar. You're welcome to uh, type questions in at any time. Um, there's also an ability to um, put a thumbs up by uh, certain questions and vote them to the top. And that's actually quite helpful for us moderators. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panelists. And um, Anam Tupton is the founder and spiritual advisor of the Dharmata Foundation, a Buddhist community based in the Bay Area of California. He grew up in Golok, the region uh, surrounding uh, Larangar, and has um, met and, and uh, been in close contact with uh, Kempo Jigme Punsok and some of the second generation Kempos. David Germano is professor of Tibetan and Buddhist studies at the University of Virginia and executive director of the Contemplative Sciences Center. He was the first scholar to research and publish on Larangar in the volume, uh, Buddhism in Contemporary Tibet, which you saw a moment ago. Uh, and Antonia Torone is assistant professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at Northwestern University. And he's done extensive research on the 10th Panchen Lama, a key figure in the founding of Larangar. So welcome. And we'll begin with a question uh, for Anam Tupton. Um, could you give us a sense um, for the significance and the impact of Larangar uh, for Buddhists in Eastern Tibet uh, in terms of its non-sectarian approach, its revival of monastic scholasticism and its engagement with so many issues, um, particularly things like the preservation of Tibetan language. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful event. Uh, uh, first, uh, in order to really understand uh, the Larong, uh, we may need to talk about uh, the life of His Holiness in Cambodia, Jigmet Penso, uh, who was a just extraordinary individual. I had the fortune to uh, receive an empowerment, Abhisheka, from him many, many years ago, I haven't been to Larongal in this life, but somehow I feel that uh, I have a, such a strong connection with uh, uh, Larongal. I feel I have been there in spirit, but not in a, a physical form. Uh, meeting with uh, His Holiness Kambo uh, Jigmet Panza was perhaps uh, the, the, the most uh, precious uh, moment in my life. Uh, I felt that when I met with him that uh, my life has been changed. And I felt that somehow I found the meaning of this uh, human life. Uh, and also I felt that uh, 
I'm going to be okay, whatever that means from their own. I know this sounds a little bit a, a weird uh, concept to many Westerners, but literally I felt that uh, from now on, I'm going to be okay, everything's going to be okay. It wasn't like some kind of rational affirmation, but uh, the depth, from the depth of my being, I felt everything's going to be okay in my life. Uh, I think as a human beings, we have our own challenges and, and difficulties uh, and the usual neuroses. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, we have a doubt and doubt can be sometimes good and sometimes it can be destructive. There are healthy doubt and unhealthy doubt. Uh, and there are unhealthy doubt, which are depicted as the Mara, the work of Mara, which can be a very detrimental obstacle on the path to the enlightenment. Uh, and uh, lucky they are never had a doubt, not even a single moment towards the His Holiness of Cambodian Medpun. So I always felt, I always believe, I believe it, I am believing, I will believe that uh, he is uh, such a sublime being like uh, uh, Pamma Sambhava or Buddha returning to this uh, end world. Uh, I just wrote uh, an article for this uh, online Buddhist magazine, a Buddhist door launched uh, from Hong Kong. And that uh, article was uh, titled as uh, Buddha was just here. And that is about uh, His Holiness. And uh, I described who he is uh, from my own understanding. So I never re really had doubt. I had this. Uh, unwearing faith towards him that he is a was extraordinary sublime enlightened being and my meeting with him was filled with magic i really can't describe exactly what happened but literally my life has been changed and uh, uh, and you know i have uh, sometimes uh, these uh, very ordinary human emotions like uh, uh, for the usual emotions, stress, anxiety, but uh, deep down, I feel there's also a sense of uh, groundedness because I feel that his blessings in my consciousness. Uh, uh, I have this uh, wonderful image of him. It's a crystal ball. Inside is the image of uh, his Lordness, Kambodji Met Penso. Uh, I have that uh, these days above my bed. Every night I look at it and it feels really good. Every morning when I wake up, I look at it and it feels very much uh, uh, blessed. Uh, and so anyway, uh, in essence, uh, uh, he, he grew up as a, a very humble monk, not as some kind of religious uh, aristocrat. And then he met with his uh, Tsai Lama or his uh, Heart Guru, Thibgaib uh, from whom he studied uh, all the Buddhist uh, scriptures, the Stras, Tantras, Shastras, uh, all David with Adi Yoga and become um, one of the greatest uh, scholars. Uh, he was a Mahapandita. And not only that, and then His Holiness was a uh, at the Mahasiddha uh, realized uh, enlightened uh, being. And I thank him as the uh, same as a uh, uh, Pama Sambhava. And then I think in the 19, maybe 80s, uh, early 80s, he uh, started uh, uh, teaching at uh, Larongar. Larongar was uh, quite uh, small at that time. And then and uh, slowly many people discovered uh, him and they start uh, showing up uh, for his teachings and then slowly Larong got from this uh, small dharma community evolved into the largest buddhist uh, monastery in the world right now i think one of the the sublime attribute of uh, Larongar is it's more than just uh, this is a huge monastery. Uh, this monastery has a, a really amazing quality. I have uh, Dharma brothers who went uh, to Larongar and studied with His Holiness Kambodjumet Pen. So 
and uh, they're transformed completely and they told me that uh, everybody who goes there are eventually transformed and that's like a remarkable yeah remarkable achievement or remarkable blessing and uh, and i think that has to do with the the sublime qualities of his holiness Cambodian with Penso. and when he died uh, uh, in a early 2000 i heard the news i was actually in berkeley and i started sobbing uncontrollably and felt uh, so much grief i felt that uh, this bright uh, sun and finally dissolved or, or set from the world and i felt that the world is going to be in some darkness this, this was all my experience but then today i feel the grief but i also feel uh, uh, hope because i see uh, his disciples are carrying his uh, legacy and, uh, and some of his disciples are just extraordinary and uh, many of you know uh, some of his disciples uh, and the people love them in Tibet completely and they are uh, very well known in Tibet and because they become who they are through their own merit uh, through their uh, wisdom love compassion integrity and one of them is a combo uh whom I met a few times uh, and uh, uh, he is uh, also very much a loving Buddha who uh, all the time embodies love, compassion and wisdom. He's extraordinary scholar, uh, Pandita, and also he's a Mahasiddha in my understanding. Uh, and, uh, and he is uh, like the uh, regent, Dharma regent of His Holiness Kambu Jigme Pen. So I feel that uh, uh, he is uh, carrying the legacy of uh, his uh, Aru Chungura. And uh, heaven him is like a heaven Kambu Jigme Pen. So in this uh, in the world, uh, uh, I was very excited to come to this uh, uh, event, but uh, I also had a little bit uh, reluctance and my reluctance coming from that uh, i worry that maybe i won't be able to express <laughs> the greatness the sublime qualities of uh, his holiness combo jimmy pento and laronga and combo Lodu. it's like uh, i'm like somebody who never left home and talking about size of the mountain meru which would be quite uh, uh, funny uh, but uh, i'm so happy that we are here and many people in the West do not know so much about uh, Laurangar or life of His Holiness Kambodji Medpenso or his uh, main disciples. Uh, uh, this uh, book is going to definitely um, uh, create a bridge, wonderful bridge between the Dharma communities in the West and then the Laurangar. That's uh, pretty much what I have to say right now, or unless you have uh, uh, some questions. Okay, thank you so much. Maybe we'll circle back with more questions um, once we've heard from our other uh, panelists. I'd like to now invite David Germano um, and uh, with the question, if you can, um, David, since you were at Larangar in the 90s, in the early early days, um, can you give us a sense for what Larangar was like and what Kempo Jigme Punsok was like as a presence there and as a charismatic um, figure in the region? And if you wanna to touch on any of the issues of um, of his impact as well, that would be wonderful. We can't hear you, David, you have to unmute. Yeah, sorry about that. So thank you, Holly. 
I, I had forgotten this panel was this weekend, but a couple of days ago I had a dream. I was in my house, but it was a little bit different than the way my house really is. There was some kind of pond or pool inside. And Kempo Jikpun came. He came with an attendant, and he was much younger than when I knew him. He was still agile in body, and he walked into the home without really saying anything. And he dove into the pond, and he searched at the bottom, and he pulled out three large vajras, like three feet long vajras. He came back up out of them. and. I was watching really carefully, I remember, and the Vajras just seemed to materialize. And then I, after he left, I went down and I just looked around to see if there was anything he'd left over, you know, some other kind of treasures or something. And I found there was this hollow and there were these stray Christmas decorations. So just some, some little trace um, of dreams I remember having a lot when I was out there. And it was 1989 to 1991 when I first met Kempo in a succession of places and spent time up in La Rungar. And I think maybe the most useful thing for me to do is just talk about seven or eight things that I remember as kind of like a snapshot of, of being there. And I had been living in Nepal, then India, then different parts of Tibet. So I had a kind of range of, of reference to compare it. And this was really a completely unique place compared to every other place I had spent time in. And so I'll just go through these seven things and then maybe just end with what uh, Anam Tupten started with a little bit of like the influence the place had on me. So one was that this was a place where these old traditions of the Nyingmapa were still alive and well. And so many other places around the diaspora and, and even Tibet, people were talking about these more contemporary or, or, or late modern figures like Mipam or Jikme Lingpa and so forth. But there in Kempo Jikpun's world, they were talking about the 14th century and the 11th century and the 12th century. And it was just a place where um, they were hearkening back to these older traditions, and, and that kind of struck me. And the other thing was this dense Tibetanness. It, it was a place that was just extraordinarily Tibetan. It was everything. They were had this great appetite for thinking about the world around them in, in, in Tibet and China and the broader world and so forth. And, and they were using Tibetan frameworks as, as a way to understand the world and organize it. And of course, Tibetan language, but not just as something they were reading, but something they were actively composing and kind of thinking about new forms and, and genres and so forth. And then in particular, an incredible commitment to place, which left an indelible impact upon me, Tibetan places and, and the value of Tibetan places and the, the ideas we have about places and the practices and the values and how these have this intrinsic relationship to the well-being of a people, in this case, Tibetan people, and the role that Kempo Jigpun had played to, to reanimate that Tibetan specificity of inhabiting these places and, and dwelling in Tibet, and how that had contributed to Tibetan well-being. Third thing was uh, this, this openness and this interest in, in doing things new and thinking kind of new thoughts. I remember a couple of years later when I was back in the U.S. and had a job at Virginia, he came out on his, Kempo Jigpun came out on his one and only visit. And I remember sitting in D.C. listening to him giving, him giving a talk um, that was just, I, I can't, it was so incredible just to think that this person had spent the life the way he did and the things he was talking about so eloquent and so wide ranging and, and uh, contemporary in character or interests of people like Kempo Tsutrim Lodra in ethnography or just these interest in outside knowledge traditions. I remember living with Tenzin Gatso, one of the, the early leaders, and his interest already from then back in, in reading about uh, Jungian analysis of dreams and a broad variety of other traditions outside of Tibetan Buddhism. Or, or I remember when I first met Sultrim Lodra, he, or actually that was a later time, I came back and, and he asked me, you know, where are you working now? I said, University of Virginia, and he kind of, rummaged through these books in back of him and he pulls up this book written by a medical doctor at the University of Virginia, Ian Stevenson, who's the world's foremost authority in uh, reincarnational studies of all things. And he'd read it in Chinese and he said, ah, you know Ian Stevenson? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. So um, another thing was the ethical conservatism. It was already very clear back then, this uh, attitude or this perspective that Kempo had about the breaching of Samaya during the Cultural Revolution and, and the seriousness of that, or the prioritization of monastic vows, even if the community was not technically a monastery and welcomed people who weren't monks. But there was this very strong sense of the, the importance of, of your ethical integrity and maintaining codes of commitments that you had taken on. And, and this obviously manifested in later ways with the Ten Virtues movement and the vegetarianism and everything else, but it was, it was already very clear back then in the late 80s and early 90s. 
And then the social mission, um, you know, a lot of it was really uh, about more traditional mediation roles that Kempo would play when, when different communities would come into conflict and so forth. But it was also clear in the air that something else was brewing, even if it hadn't taken the form it later took, when you had these very manifest notions that the monastery should go out into today's secular or contemporary society and do things differently from how they did them in the past, whether the Tibetan knowledge projects or the K through 12 schools or the old person's home or the Tibetan language initiatives, the Tibetan knowledge projects, etc. Um, it, it was already there just in the air, air, although the activity was more focused on these traditional mediations. And also back then, the organized Chinese outreach was, of course, nothing like it later came to be, but it was already very clearly a defining aspect of the community. Um, there were a number of Chinese, and they were focused on uh, how to systematically represent the tradi Tibetan Buddhist traditions uh, in Chinese language to Chinese people, and there were Chinese people in residency there and so forth. And the controversies um, were also already there. Um, the controversies revolved around Kempo's ethical stance, uh, which some people found too harsh or, or, or too, um, you know, too, too doctrinaire. Um, also, the, the ambition, the, the scale and the ambition of the place was just so manifest, even though it, it wasn't the huge place that it came to be, it was so clearly uh, the people who were there thought it was the center of the universe, of the Tibetan Buddhist universe, and they were actively thinking about how it could scale up and, um, and diversify, it, both as a, as a single institution, but also with outreach and networks throughout the plateau and, and into China. And that ambition and that scale also caused controversy. The fact that Kempo was this, uh, not just a, a great scholar, but someone who actively embraced the visionary mantle of his tradition to reveal treasures and, 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 and reveal treasures out of the ground or out of thin air and so forth from the distant past, this also triggered controversy. Also, the social mission was something that has been an active issue um, in, in Eastern Tibet in particular from way back then. The idea should monasteries be about recovering and restoring the kind of uh, past practices and so forth, or should they be taking innovative roles and getting out there and doing things actively, like with orphanages and schools and, and secular knowledge traditions and so forth. And that also was triggering controversy. The Chinese engagement, um, some people felt that this was something that was problematic. Uh, geographical chauvinism was clearly there. People who didn't like having a center of Tibetanness in, in, in southern Golok. Um, sectarian partisanship, even though the tradition, the, the center had people from various sectarian traditions, it was clearly uh, Nyingmapa in orientation overall. And there was, of course, a lot of sectarian um, negativity towards a, a Nyingmapa based center being so prominent. And then another source of controversy was that uh, it was there was this debate back and forth about can can we get too big? I mean, should we get too big? Should we stop? And, and Kempo was always of the perspective, no, we, we need to reach out to everyone we can reach out to and, and um, kind of optimize our, our, our capacity to engage others and, and to scale up and, and to spread the the Buddhist teachings and so forth. And there were others who felt like this is going to inevitably trigger a government crackdown for not just you, but for everyone. And that was a source of controversy. And so uh, just at the personal level, kind of the way these things left a, a major influence on me and the kind of commitments I made in my life, I think one takeaway I had was a, a love, a deep and abiding love for Tibet, not just for Buddhism, but Tibetan people and, and the ways they orient themselves in the world in a day-to-day -day fashion, not just in doctrine and practice. Also, this idea that place is so crucial to people's well-beings, that our identities are interwoven in place with pla the places in which we live, particularly indigenous peoples, in ways that are just impossible to extricate them from. Um, a, a sense of the value of ambition and scale, something that Kempo Jikpun uh, communicated to me very clearly, and something that left a big impression on me a feeling of permission that you could have these deep vertical commitments to this text, this knowledge system, this naughty complex idea, and yet at the same time just roam wildly and crazily, like the way that some of my best friends at La Rungar would do across different traditions and, and times. And then um, a sense of social responsibility towards Tibetan communities, and then that's the end of my time. Um, and then the last two things is 
uh, an interest in impossible common grounds between peoples who hate each other or individuals and entities that you hate yourself and thinking that even though those common grounds seem impossible, uh, perhaps there are ways to establish it, something that Kempo was always very resolute towards. And finally, uh, I think I took away from that, the time I spent with the community, that translation is not prim primarily between languages and nor is it primarily between text, but it's first and foremost between different worlds. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Really wonderful to hear your perspective, not just on the sort of um, variety of um, aspects of Larangar, but also what, what, how that touched you and moved you personally, uh, very much following in Anam Tipton's um, footsteps with that. Thank you. Um, so our third panelist, Antonio Torone, um, I would like to uh, ask you if you would um, tell us about the Punchin, role, Punchin Lama's role in the founding of Larangar and more broadly in the adaptation of the Buddhist Academy as a new kind of institution uh, in Tibet. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very, very good. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. And of course, I would like, first of all, um, to take this uh, opportunity for a few seconds to thank you, Holly, for for the volume um, and for including my contribution, of course, and organizing the symposium uh, with Shambhala and with uh, the help of Michael, Michael Sheehy. And especially, I, um, I want to also uh, imagine how hard it's been for you in the past few weeks after what happened in Boulder. And so I find this very remarkable and um, it's a great opportunity for me and it's very I'm very grateful and honored to be here with so many friends colleagues and also inspiring figures and I want to remind David David Germano I don't know if he remembers but um, in 1997 I think it was July or August I was uh, a newly enrolled student at Tibetan Tibet University in and we met at the airport he was coming to Lhasa and I was already there. I was picking up some medicines, I think, from the airport because someone brought them from Chengdu. I was having uh, uh, intestinal problems, gastrointestinal problems. And and uh, for a few days, we met and we had lunch together, I think, about a troll. And I was immediately captivated by Germano's, you know, David Germano's um, uh, knowledge about the NEMA, the treasure revealers. And I just met two amazing um, mind-boggling treasure of healers in the middle of of, uh, of Lhasa you know, in front of the Jokan, and I remember discussing my plans for a dissertation. So um, I, I find it very really nice to be here next to David and next to Kimball and I'm to Ken. It's a good opportunity for me. Um, so, anyways, as for the as for the my contribution to, to the volume, Voices from Larungar. Um, I think that my main point, and I don't have a lot of time, but I just wanna be sure that I, I, I am clear in, in saying that my main point today is that um, it's, not, um, it's not possible uh, to understand the structure, the rise, and also the flourishing of Larungar um, under Cambodge and Mepunsok's leadership, or even more nowadays with the, with the, um, you know, the popularity of Larungar and some of these um, highly erudite campus, um, without centering and without um, paying close attention to the influence of Chogi Gyaltsen, the 10th Panchen Lama. And the second point is uh, that um, if I could only make, let's say, one single observation um, today about what I mean by this, um, I would uh, uh, definitely direct us to consider just the name. Um, the name that Larungar is widely known as um, nowadays, uh, the Larun, in English, Larung Five Sciences uh, Buddhist Academy, or Larung Wumin Fu Yuan, or Loblin in, in Tibetan, I mean, is, is a name that was created, was, uh, was given and written down as a, as a Tibetan, in a form of a Tibetan calligraphy, um, an offer to Cambodge Mepunsok by Chogi Gyatsen, the 10th Panchalama. Um, so what I'm saying here is that we need to contextualize a little bit more um, in, in order to pay justice to, to the phenomenon that eventually Lorungar um, represents um, in order to have a, a, a clear picture 
of uh, the, the, the modalities that uh, La Rungar um, kind of uh, embraced in terms of modernity, in terms of revival, if you want to call it that way, in terms of uh, growth, and in some of the features that it has represented and was influential all over Eastern Tibet. You know, I met Cambodian Me Pun Sok myself, uh, I think a couple of times at least, um, in the uh, very early 2000s before he, he, he died. And I've been in Lavangar several times, uh, both of officially as a light of field worker, so to speak, uh, with some um, uh, little contacts that I had in Serta and sometimes not officially, um, dressed like a monk during moments where Larungar was not really opened. And uh, Tenzin Genzo um, um made let, let me stay with some of his uh, closest monks and, and I would go around dressed like a monk. And, and But I've been um, always fascinated, unlike what David um, uh, just told us about the early years. When I arrived in Larungar um, in the early 2000s, um, for me, the Tibetanness, yes, it was amazing, but the shock came for, the, for me, at least for the Chinese presence. I remember um, what I was really uh, impressed and shocked was not only um, the magnitude of the, of the population, but the, uh, the vast amount of, of Chinese lay and monastics, both female and, and male, and also lay Chinese uh, uh, practitioners, male and female. I was uh, uh, eating in Chinese-run vegetarian restaurants. I was uh, uh, chatting with Chinese interpreters and translators who themselves were monastics. I was um, I was offered Chinese language books translated from Kempo's speeches. And I was uh, often, I would join just out of curiosity, the, the Dharma talks in Chinese by Kempo's there to a huge, Chinese Sangha, and eventually they created a, a, a monastery on, on their own. And so for me, the thought was like, uh, why and how is this possible in this part of Tibet? And what is the agency here? And who's behind of this? And um, without minimizing the role of Kempo Jimmy Kinsok at all, um, which has never been my, my intent, and I find it really also counterproductive. But what I do, I want to point out that when Cambodia Mekunsok founded Larungar, Larungar was just a handful of monks uh, around a highly charismatic leader, as we you know, very uh, popular in terms of revelations and fluency in Zochen and virtual citizens. And, and um, only later on, after a, a few years, Larungar exploded um, um, due to the contact of the Cambodia uh, Mekunsok with the Panchen Lama. In, in creating something that would not only allow the, the people and the population uh, around him to, to grow and develop, but also to, to allow the institution to gain traction and actually be allowed to um, thrive, unlike many others uh, that didn't particularly accept some of the guidelines that the party and the new uh, Political, I mean, the religious policies uh, of the of the Chinese leadership, and so I I started to research, and like many of us, like many of, of those, like my peers and my friends among you, realize um, the the. Tenth Panch Lama was very influential in the 80s due to his extensive travels and visits in, in, uh, in uh, Kham and in, in Amdo, where he gave talks and speeches, met with people. He was very humble. He, he was among the people, something that by itself already is something that has never happened in the history of Tibet. The Dalai Lama or the Panch Lama in the past never traveled among common people. And so he was very available and addressed his speeches and he talks and participating in local rituals and, sp and spoke in schools and in, in, uh, not just in monasteries uh, to, to a wide range of, of people. And, and people remember that, they were highly impressed. And so the Panchen Lama's role was, uh, was uh, highly influential in that he incarnated not only the spiritual tradition of Tibet being at that time at the highest uh, only religious and political leader um, to, to be in Tibet, considering that the Dalai Lama um, was in India already, but also um, incarnated a, a socialist ideology that he never denied. 
it was always been always been very clear and, and that gained him uh, um, support and also as we know a lot of attacks and controversies but I think at the Panchalama um, uh, uh, by reading his speeches and reading his talks was very clear that um, behind his idea of modernization and revival of the Buddhist doctrine and practice was also his conviction that the socialist path um, as, as uh, constructed by, by his Chinese leaders was conducive to, uh, to, to growth, development and advancement for Tibetans um, in his, in, uh, in his, among his fellow, Tibetan, fellow Tibetans. And so when I speak of modernity, of the type of modernities, I just want to briefly remind Mind that um, remind you all that uh, within the social socio religious uh, um, reality uh, of the time in the eight, uh, 80s under Deng Xiaoping the new movement of reform and, and opening um, some of the forms of modernity that Larungar uh, became known for um, were all included in the Panchalama's um, you know speeches talks and vision including lay people's involvement in the practice diverse demo demographics inclusive of male female lay monastics and if multi ethnic and also international um, devotees philanthropy I want to remind that the Panchalama was one of the first to establish a the Kanji and Kunsu was a, a philanthropical um, philanthropic oriented um, uh, organization where uh, through donations and donations to him, he actually reversed and, and, and used it to, for, for educational purposes and building schools or, or sending uh, uh, school, school related material and, and stationery. Also experiments in, in education and instruction, um, eclectic approach to Buddhist practice and a focus on monastic um, discipline, study of scriptures, um, a decentralized and multi-handed form of administration and a kind of multilingual approach uh, for monastics and lay people alike. Um, and also um, he was a, a introduced form of uh, abridged versions of Tibetan uh, Buddhist scriptures to facilitate um, uh, study and not just to enhance memorization. Um, there's a whole collection of short scriptures that he actually eventually used in his own, in his own Buddhist um, High Institute of, um, sorry, the, the Tibetan High uh, Buddhist Academy in, in Beijing. And so what I what I uh, tried to convey through my little uh, uh, excerpts in the text and my introduction, so to speak, is that the Panchalama was really pivotal uh, in, in this attempt. And, and, and through Larungar, I can see, we can, we can see um, the Panchalama's uh, vision, the, the Panchalama's um, interest, and the Panchalama's attempts to, to really um, help fellow Tibetans to um, uh, kind of uh, find a, 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 a new dignified and moralized path after decades of destruction, especially during the Agricultural Revolution. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, I really appreciate all um, three presenters, such um, rich accounts. And maybe um, now I'll invite people to put any questions in A and to circle back just to this issue of the impact of Larangar in um, Eastern Tibet um, and any of you on the Mtupton, uh, David, Germano, Antonio um, would like to speak to that. And then we'll all be um, starting to surface some of the questions from the audience. Anam Triptanla, would you like to begin just to say a few remarks? I know before this uh, panel, we had talked about, uh, you had talked a lot about the revival of monastic uh, scholasticism and Larangar's non-sectarian approach. Um, if you have any words on that. Uh, you have to unmute. Yeah, everyone did a really good job. Uh, I'm very much enjoying this uh, whole uh, panel discussion. Uh, all of you pretty much uh, said uh, about uh, the impact of Larungar 
uh, on the Tibetan society. Well, I feel that we have to spend perhaps a few days to really talk about uh, the impact of the Varonga on Tibetan society and beyond. Uh, but I would say Laronga is uh, almost uh, uh, unprecedented uh, a story uh, that never really occurred in the history of uh, Tibet. Uh, though there were many great monasteries, uh, but Laronga is uh, uh, in many ways unprecedented, uh, of course, uh, for its size and also it uh, 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 basically gained uh, uh, a reverence uh, uh, among all the Tibetans from different walks of life. For example, uh, um, his holy Kampong Jigme Penso is called Yijin uh, Norpa, uh, means Jindaman uh, in Sanskrit, the wish for fun in, in gem. People even don't uh, really call his uh, name directly uh, out of reverence, they call him and he's uh, well respected by not just only Nyangma Pass. Uh, uh, so, for example, I have a hard time to say his holiness is Nyangma Pa. I think uh, we can't really put him into any kind of categories. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's just, uh, to me, it's too great to put into any kind of category like uh, lineage or tradition. Though, of course, he, he is a uh, very much the Nyangma master, but he's revered by Gelug Pass, Kwarjit Pass, uh, Sarkya Pass, Jonang Pass, and so forth. So, and uh, I think in the 1980s, uh, uh, the, especially the scholasticism in Nyangma tradition is uh, uh, quite poor in my understanding, even though there were great Nyangma Ba uh, scholars and uh, masters who understand uh, the sutras, tantras, and rituals. Uh, and in His Holiness, uh, since he built uh, the Varongar and he trained just so many nuns and monks uh, uh, to be uh, this uh, bright uh, uh, scholars and practitioners. They're not only scholars, they're really just sincere practitioners. Uh, and uh, he also uh, not only started teaching the Nyingma text, especially uh, the Nyingma curriculum based on the, the works of Njamgon uh, Mpam, but uh, uh, also he uh, uh, taught uh, the works of uh, the great Gwadjit uh, masters, uh, Sarkya masters, uh, and Gyalukpa, such as Lama Tsongkhapa, Sarkya Pandita and so forth. Uh, and so he revived uh, 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 a whole tradition of uh, scholasticism as well as also practice to a whole new level, not only within the Nyingma lineage, but in all other lineages too. And then he's not only revered uh, uh, among monastics, but he's very much loved by ordinary Tibetan people Many of them are not particularly educated about Buddhist doctrine, but they have so much uh, love and devotion towards him. And I think they all knew deeply who he is. And also, uh, I think he just held the, the people of Tibet in such a, such a, a love, that's all I can say, an unconditional love. And so, uh, yeah, I... I feel that we have to spend a lot more time to talk about it. And because of Laronga, now a lot of the monasteries have a wonderful shattas and diptras. Shatta is a, the school where you study the scriptures and to uh, have a, a more academic training. Dipta is where you uh, simply practice uh, sadhanas and meditations. Uh, so the, these two uh, schools, the Shat and Dripta, are very much revived among and many, uh, many uh, Tibetan monasteries. I think, if not for His Holiness, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, of course, uh, will be just doing fine, but uh, may not uh, be just uh, filled with so much potency and 
blessing, when I say potency, I'm talking about potency of liberating our consciousness, may not be so filled with the potency and blessings uh, as now. And when you look at uh, his, his disciples, they're extraordinary to me. You know, I have said in my article in the Buddhist uh, door, by the way, my uh, I'm a columnist for the Buddhist door, and my column is called a Dharma Gossip. It's not really about Dharma Gossip, but it's to get uh, attention from everybody. So under that uh, name, I have been writing uh, all these articles. Uh, last time when I said that uh, in my article, you know, I sometimes had this kind of longing to see, wish that I was maybe uh, in uh, Tibet in the 8th century when Bama Samba was teaching, and you know, I wish I was there. But then when I met with His Holiness, I feel I really didn't have to be there in the present Pama Samba Buddha. He he was like that. And you can see and that his disciples uh, uh, and they are considered uh, uh, very noble. Actually, uh, all the Tibetan lay people have so much reverence to the, the monks, nuns from Larongar. Uh, and because they are demonstrating all the time uh, noble qualities, dignity. Uh, humility, education, dharma education, as well as also deep insight and and, and bodhicitta. So that's just the amazing impact that Larongar has. Uh, so Larongar is right now uh, uh, almost like a, I might like a spiritual compass or something like that. Uh, and lots of Tibetans look up to Larongar and uh, they look up to the and Kambos there, the, the teachers are there, and, and Tibetan people really listen to uh, the teachings and advisors, messages from those uh, Kambos, and, and they follow them as a very much reliable, trustworthy, and uh, infallible guides. Uh, I think Tibet is very lucky to have a Laronga, and those teachers at Laronga, right now, Kambos are are really amazing, as I said earlier, and they become who they are by their own merit. It's not like they become these river teachers through some kind of uh, uh, questionable system. And uh, they, they earn <laughs> uh, devotion from people through their own merit. And also in many ways, Lavronga is a very much uh, uh, egalitarian and uh, I'm sure uh, uh, some of you went there, saw that, and this is a region of his own in Kambo Jigmet Penso. And so it's not a place where you become teacher by using any system. You only become teacher if you're in the merit. And his holiness create all these systems in a way that uh, I think Buddhism will be pure and uh, live along on the earth and continuously liberate uh, the consciousness of. Uh, uh, humanity and he, he is very visionary uh, his holiness was visionary uh, I I know many people who met with him and he will say something it will happen actually down the road maybe in the 10 years or 20 years I personally actually witnessed it. something he said happened uh, and I actually had a, a first hand uh, uh, experience that he would say something and then it would happen uh, sometime maybe in 10 years or 20 years, but he's somebody who really can see, uh, uh, yeah, I don't really have a word, but see a lot of that uh, just, uh, mm, uh, we can see easy, that's all I can say. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, David, would you like to jump in on this question? And there's been, um, you know, a further question around the sort of non-sectarian or Rime approach and, and to what degree that is, um, uh, that is the case in terms of curriculum and drawing on, let's say, not just um, texts from various traditions, but some of the Rime masters themselves. So anything you'd like to add in terms of impact and um, non-sectarianism? Yeah, in terms of impact, just to keep it really concise, I think, first of all, there's the obvious impact that a lot of people who were trained there didn't stay there. 
And so when you travel throughout eastern Tibet and also into other parts of Tibet to a lesser degree, you'll visit various hermitages and monasteries and communities, and you'll find people who were educated there taking leading roles in a broad variety of contexts. So that impact of the social network that they, they spawned, that even though it became such a large community, so many other people didn't stay there, but went off back to other places and sites and, and brought the, the lessons and kind of impetus of, of, that, of La Rungar uh, to those places. And secondly, I think it was it played a really has played a really crucial role in helping Tibetans imagine what monasticism might be, um, whether you like it or not. What that what that pattern is, but that pattern has been very influential. And not to say that they were the only ones doing it, but that they played this very prominent public role in, in leading the path forward to thinking that monasticism could do these things. One, of course, was the Chinese outreach that Antonio was talking about which was apparent everywhere back there in, in 89 and 90 and 91, but it was particularly intense there in, in a very public way. And then also the kind of social mission, as I talked about, the idea that monasticism could have a social mission outside of just mediation or um, providing some educational services or ritual services, but doing this broad variety of things. Also the notion of publications, that monasteries could come back and and publish editions and compositions, a very traditional role, but one that was uh, at risk after the Cultural Revolution. And they kind of invested in that in a really major way. And then the intellectual creativity and the kind of wide ranging interest across not just Tibetan topics, but other topics. And so I think that that paradigm, even though it was paradoxically not formally a monastery, that paradigm for what uh, a monastery could look like um, was, I think, very influential. And then also just the kind of, the, the, like I mentioned, the scale and the ambition, the idea that what the possibilities were in Tibet were good or even better than what they were in the diaspora, because there was this, this insecurity back in the 80s after the Cultural Revolution and so many great teachers passed away or relocated in the diaspora. And La Rungar kind of, along with some other places, really recentered gravity, raised the stakes for what was possible for religious communities on, on the Tibetan plateau and kind of authorized in some sense and, and permitted, not, not formally, but just in terms of impact on people's imagination and um, uh, this, this notion of, of large, ambitious and, and scalable religious communities um, back in Tibet. So I think those are just some kind of immediate thoughts I have about the, the impact, apart from all the particulars that I know we'll be talking about in the second panel. In terms of the ecumenical side of things, Back when the community was, was small, and, and it, was, it was so much smaller back in the late 80s and early 90s, I mean, there was lots of green space. Uh, I remember uh, I was living in this little um, uh, pagoda that had one bed in it. The second floor had a bed, and there was a walkway around the bed. And it was just in the middle of like a big green area, you know, for, from all directions. And, so, and they had lots of green space to do rituals. So it was, it was so much smaller. But even back then, Kempo was very resolute that, I mean, clearly his, his uh, most central interests were in Nyingmapa traditions, that, that was very clear. But he was so um, explicitly overt about his desire that this not be perceived simply as a Nyingmapa center. And he actively taught other traditions. He would himself teach people from the Guluk tradition or the Sakya tradition and so forth. And he would include it in the curriculum and really actively welcome people coming from other traditions and not trying to convert them, but just having them stay and then go back to their own tradition and continue that tradition. So it was something back in, in that time um, that was clearly from Kempo's point of view, something that he saw as very important and he took concrete active measures to, to make it that way. Um, so. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David, for that perspective. There's a question in the chat specifically for Antonio about, um, I'll just read it. Why do you think the Panchen Lama worked through the Nyingma rather than his own traditional gay look? Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for the question. But I don't think he was specific. Did you say through the Nyingma or for the Nyingma? I, I didn't quite get. Did you? It says through the Nyingma, but, oh, but yeah. 
spoke about. Yeah, no, uh, I, I think he didn't really specifically work for, through the Nima. I think it came, um, uh, the Ten Pancha Lama was in touch with many of the highest uh, spiritual leaders of his times, Gelupa, Sakya, Nima Pas. Um, he traveled extensively, and in Serta, he met Kenpo Jime Pansok. I don't think there was a, a very specific, um, it was very specifically targeting. I think there was communication, there was uh, interaction between the two, just like in, in many others. And um, so I don't think there was a, a just a, a a, a, an attempt to just to favor or inspire or assist Cambodia and Pensok. In fact, um, I visited many other um, institutions, monastic and non-monastics, and where the Panchalama had a very significant, significant and direct role. Some are Nima, but some are Gelupas. Uh, so I don't think that's the question. The question is more, um, how did he do that? And my point, since the Panchalama didn't really leave behind authored texts, right? He never author an autobiography, he never authored uh, 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 books where he discusses uh, concepts of Buddhism and Buddhist modernism or anything. What we have are the, his talks. And so uh, these talks happened across Tibet. As I said, publicly, or sometimes uh, political talks during during meetings, during uh, comedy, uh, committees, uh, gatherings with cadres, Tibetan cadres. And so these are the moments where uh, the Panchi Lama really engaged personally and uh, with local um, uh, leaders, both spiritual and, and political. And so, um, again, it's not just that it targeted or favored one tradition or other. What, what it was trying it was to convey the universal message of trying to adapt to the new sociopolitical uh, situation, right? The new sociopolitical um, reality of Tibet, which is which was and still is part of China, and how to do that in a way that is both conducive to maintaining a certain um, um, kind of a protection of traditional values and habits, customs, and education, while also adapting it uh, to the, 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 the new prerogatives and the guidelines and requirements of, of the political leadership, which was obviously communist. Um, in China and in Tibet. And I think he was mediating this role. He was really trying to convey to leaders like Kimbo Jimmy Kunsok, but also others. Like, I, I want to remind you the recently uh, published book by our friend Nicole Willock. She also addresses this issue, right? We Until now, we've been pretty much um, uh, caught between this kind of binary understanding of pro-anti-China, pro-anti-Dalai Lama, uh, Panchen Lama uh, groups in, in, in China trying to uh, favor one political goal to the other. But actually the situation is way more subtle, way more nuanced. And leaders like uh, the Panchen Lama and some of the other ones who stayed in, in Tibet trying to work toward the development of Tibetans within Tibet and within China, um, were engaging all together in this type of approach, right? And the Panchalama was, uh, in due to circumstances, the, the real and only legitimate political and religious leaders. And that's why uh, he, he was uh, kind of uh, invited, so to speak, or, or, or asked to work with the Communist Party in order to facilitate certain communications with his fellow Tibetans. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I really wanna thank all three of our panelists in this first panel. And um, we'll have to wind up um, at this point. So we leave plenty of room for our second panel, um, but I just wanna acknowledge some of the wonderful questions in uh, the Q&A that our next set of panelists might uh, look at, especially the question about uh, Lama uh, Ani Mumso and also the contemporary um, conditions um, at Larangar, which I think is more appropriate for our second generation, our discussion of um, second generation voices at Larangar and what's what's happening now. So we have actually only uh, touched on the first two chapters in the volume. So Antonio wrote about the 10th Panjan Lama. I wrote about uh, Kempo Jigme Punsok and translated, we both translated excerpts from their speeches and writings. And the second half of the panel, which we'll turn to, or the second half of the symposium, which we'll turn to now, we'll
will be looking much more at second generation voices. And I wonder whether um, people are in favor of taking just a, a two or three minute um, break before starting up at five. 15, that's uh, mountain time, but quarter past the hour with the second panel. I'm seeing some nods among our panelists. Um, and I will be then turning it over to Michael Sheehy from the University of Virginia, who will be moderating that panel and introducing it. So thank you all. We'll see you back in three minutes. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Sheehy at the University of Virginia. Welcome back after this first session. We're now going to switch to the second panel, which is um, bringing into conversation four of our translators and contributors to this marvelous book edited by Holly Gailey, which um, is out soon. I encourage you to get a copy. And um, today we'll be talking particularly in the second panel with Catherine Hardy from Hong Kong Baptist University, Jeff Barstow from Oregon State University, from Pema Tso from Southwest University of Nationalities in Chengdu, and with Sarah Jacoby, who's at Northwestern University. Our focus for this um, second session is the voices of the second generation at Larangar and how these contemporary leaders at Larangar are addressing a variety of modern social issues relevant to Tibetans inside Tibet. To discuss some of these most salient themes, we've organized this session into three conversations or sort of topical conversations um, that reflect the writings and the activities of these leaders and that are central to the book. The first will be animal rights and welfare and vegetarianism with Catherine and Jeff. The second will be gender and women's voices with Pemetso and Sarah. And I'll make some uh, brief mention and discussion about the, um, my chapter on science in Tibet. After each um, conversation with uh, our panelists, we're gonna turn to the audience for one or two questions around the topic that we've discussed. So please, I encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A and there's a, there's a thumbs up signal. And if you can bump up, if you use the thumbs up uh, signal, it bumps up the questions, which is very helpful um, to us to see what are the most promising questions. And we'll take those um, that rise to the top. So with that, I'd really like to, to turn to you, Jeff, and ask to sort of start and give us a sense, if you can, of a kind of um, historical backdrop of vegetarianism in Tibet. There's been a lot of talk about um, animal rights and vegetarianism associated with Larangar. And, uh, you know, it's often associated with being a, a sort of new thing in Tibet as a fad. And um, if you could sort of historicize this and, and give some cultural or, or historical context for vegetarianism pre-1950s in Tibet and anything that you'd like to add about how this emerged in association with Kimpo Jigpun's role or, or Larangar. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael. I will begin by echoing others and saying just sort of how pleased I am to be here today and what an honor it is to be on, a same, on the same panel with um, so many people that I respect so much. Um, this question of the sort of historical perspectives on vegetarianism in Tibet, I think really is driven by the point that you just made, Michael, about how a lot of people have suggested that this sort of concern about eating meat is really a very new thing um, in Tibetan culture. And I think, strictly speaking, I, don't th I simply don't think that's true, though many aspects and many really important aspects of the contemporary movement definitely differ from earlier forms of vegetarianism. Um, I, mean, we, I think we have plenty of textual evidence that many individual figures adopted vegetarianism prior to the 1950s, um, almost exclusively, if not exclusively, for religious Buddhist reasons. Um, I can think of references to individual vegetarians uh, dating at least as early as the 11th century. 
possibly before then, and uh, continuing essentially unbroken down through the 1950s. There were times when vegetarianism was more popular, uh, times when it was clearly less popular. Uh, I think of particular sort of um, sort of high points in the movement being central Tibet from sort of the 14th through the 16th centuries, um, and then Kham from the 19th century down through um, really sort of the early to mid 19th century down through 1950s. Um, and so the, the evidence that I, I'm talking about here really primarily comes from Namtar, from these religious biographies, where this sort of the practice of vegetarianism is really always presented as a particularly virtuous practice. So you get the sense in the text that, oh, this person, this particular Lama is this really amazing Lama. He was a vegetarian or she was a vegetarian. And so that's like, it's sort of proof of their, of their virtuous standing. Um, so it's also then a pretty individual kind of thing. I, I don't think we have a lot of evidence of what we might think of as like collective or mass vegetarian movements. Um, there's some limited evidence that particular monasteries might have been sort of strongly promoted or even mandated vegetarianism. I'm thinking particularly of Moore Monastery, uh, the, the head of the Moore Pasakya, which um, may well have actually been vegetarian for a couple of centuries following its founding. Um, and there's, you know, other sort of similar sort of monastic practice, though it's also really not at all clear how strictly any of these regulations were enforced, right? You know, so we, we see a rule in the rule book doesn't necessarily mean that that was done. Um, but really, overall, it seems clear that most of the sort of pre-communist period vegetarianism was focused on individuals and um, it was seen as a, a sort of very virtuous practice that someone could adopt if they so chose, but was not seen as something that they would necessarily, people would have felt strongly that they sort of needed to do, um, if that makes sense. And so that presents it in, as we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, I don't want to sort of jump the gun here, but I think a fairly different kind of vision of how vegetarianism should be practiced than what we start to get with uh, the Larangar Kempos. It was an ideal, but not necessary, not a necessity, uh, not a necessary part of um, religious practice. That's great. Thanks so much, Jeff. And, and Catherine, could you elaborate a little bit on this um, idea and the practices really of animal protection and the advocacy um, of animal protection by these Larangar leaders. Um, there's been a kind of movement, uh, even a campaign of sorts within Tibet and um, Larangar leaders have very much been seen to be at the fore of this. Could you talk a little bit about this please? Uh, well, I suppose that um, a concern for the equality of sentient life is really part of the intergenerational ethos at Larunga, and that the uh, second generation Kempos, but obviously beginning with Kempo Jimmy Punsok, have uh, promoted a number of animal centered compassion practices vis a vis. Uh, Tibetan communities, but also, as I'll go on to talk about, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Chinese, Han Chinese uh, Dharma communities as well. Um, probably the three principal forms of, 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 of these practices are vegetarianism, as Jeff just mentioned, um, also abstaining from taking life, um, primarily in the form of uh, refraining from selling one's livestock into slaughter. And then the third one would be the ritual practice of life liberation. Um, these have been practiced, sort of uh, promoted in different contexts, but certainly the um, um, refraining of uh, taking life and selling livestock in, uh, into slaughter has been uh, often couched within um, the Greater Ten Virtues movement, which has been a mass sort of piety, vow-taking movement that really um, gained strength uh, across Tibetan areas in the late 2000s and 2010s. So. Yeah, and it was great to hear David Germano in the first panel talk about the sort of inclinations that were already present in the early days towards this kind of, um, yeah, 
towards these ethics and, and how present they were. And it's great to see them sort of manifest in these variety of ways. You know, um, could you talk a little bit more, Catherine, and then Jeff chime in any time here, particularly about the, the Chinese audiences and, and the Han Chinese involvement in, um, in this broader movement? Um, so, um, so these particular practices that I just mentioned um, have been also promoted in the uh, Larung Kempo's outreach activities vis-a-vis -vis the Han Chinese, uh, Han Chinese world. Um, they haven't taken the same form um, as, uh, in the, as in Tibetan society, so they haven't uh, come in the form of, uh, for example, a mass vow taking movement. Um, nevertheless, through their teaching activities and other outreach activities, um, practices like vegetarianism and uh, life liberation have been strongly um, emphasized. Um, refraining from taking life similarly has been emphasized, but um, because demographically speaking, these really are two different constituencies that fall within the greater umbrella of the Larong community, the ways in which these um, the emphases have been elaborated um, has been quite different. So, so um, obviously, refraining from selling livestock into future is of um, is 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 of direct relevance in um, Tibetan pastoral areas where this has become quite a controversial issue, but is not really very relevant at all for Han Chinese audiences, most of whom are members of the urban middle class, and uh, uh, their livelihoods don't hinge on um, you know animals um, in in at all. Um, having said that, uh, the practice of life liberation, which is um, uh, the what my chapter actually focuses on, is um, a ritual practice which is uh, has a has a long history in in Chinese Buddhist lay practice in particular, and that is something that has uh, received particular elaboration vis-a-vis -vis the Han Chinese world. Uh, vegetarianism similarly has been um, emphasized, but perhaps a little bit dissimilar from what Jeff said. Uh, vegetarianism, of course, in the Han Chinese Buddhist or in the Chinese Buddhist tradition, is a very has a very long and established history, and so uh, from that point of view, I think that particular um, emphasis uh, resonated quite easily. Did you want to add anything to that, Jeff? Any thoughts? Yeah, I can, I'll just sort of jump in for a second. One of the, I mean, this sort of question of where does, what's the, the role of the influence of sort of different communities of developing yeah. this, um, this ideal uh, is a really interesting one. And I don't, I you know, I don't want to sort of diminish the sense of the role of the Han Chinese community in this, but I do want to, one of the things that I think is really interesting, at least to my mind, in looking at, for instance, like Kempo Sutra Lodro's uh, texts and talks, is the, the actual rhetoric that he uses in making these arguments, which is actually really strikingly similar to some of the pre-communist Tibetan texts that I look at. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. Of texts written by Jigme Lenpa um, and uh, Shabkar, with where there's this, you get a sense that there's a really a, a strong attempt not to sort of get all scholastic with the rule book, right? Like, well, what does the rule say? How are we going to parse this rule? But to create a real affective response in the reader. This, you know, they're they're presenting like, oh, the animal feels this and it suffers in this way, and this horrible thing happens to it. So, you know, imagine yourself in that place. And that's the same kind of rhetoric and the same kind of argumentation that I see in some of the stuff that Kembo Sujimodro is, for mm -hmm. instance, writing. And so at, at least on the level of rhetoric there, I do think that there is, you know, some continuity between the sort of the pre-1950, pre-communist vegetarian, vegetarian ideal and then the, its contemporary implementation with it, again, as Kat was saying, one of the, the biggest differences being the sense that now it's being promoted so much more widely and so much more broadly than I think it ever was, as far as I can tell that it ever was. Yeah, thank you. You know, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't uh, bring up the conversation about controversies. There's been so many controversies inside and outside Tibet um, surrounding meat eating, um, oftentimes in uh, conversation directly with these leaders from Larangar. 
you know, there are positions on being vegetarian as a, on vegetarianism and being vegetarian and, and there's antipathy that has emerged within Tibet about some of these positions, particularly from those aligned with, with pastoral identities, you know, the whole nomadic way of life is, um, is seeing a transformation, a dramatic transformation. And vegetarianism is sometimes seen by some Tibetans as a strike against nomadic way of life. So I'm wondering as a sort of question to both of you, um, how have you understood this? How has it been framed by, by Larangar leaders and anything you have to say really about this kind of broader conversation happening inside Tibet? Would you like to um, perhaps start, Jeff, and I, I'll follow up? Sure. Yeah, I can, please. Yeah, I, I can try to, to jump on that. I mean, in many ways, honestly, Michael, I think you just framed it really, really well, um, at least as far as I, I understand it, in that there is a lot of a, a really strong pushback, particularly on um, the question of vegetarianism and anti-slaughter to some of the positions that the Larangar Kempos have staked out. Um, and a lot of that resistance and you know, I, I think anger uh, directed at Larangar is, comes out of a sense that this is almost like you know, a, another nail in the coffin of yeah. um, pastoral life. And this lifestyle that's already under so much pressure from you know, government regulation from capitalism, from whatever we want to throw in here, that's already leaning on, you know, maintaining pastoralism, nomadism as a viable life. And then you know, I think that really understandable resentment when the Kempo, you know, these religious leaders come along and say, oh, and by the way, don't sell your animals for slaughter. And so that's the thing. And, and I, you know, I have this one particular memory that is really vivid and people who heard me talk about this before will have probably heard me say this before this, um, you know, good Tibetan friend of mine in uh, inside Tibet, um, who obviously I won't name, um, who's like, was just really like a level of anger I hadn't seen in him before when he told me that Kempo Sutram Lodra was destroying Tibetan culture. Right. And so this is, it, it's an issue that it is really emotional and very strong for a lot of people for very, I mean, I think straightforwardly justifiable and real reasons. And there's a real tension, uh, a real tension in some of these Tibetan communities. Yeah, that's great. Kat, did you have anything you want to add? Uh, well, um, maybe maybe a few things. You know, I think that there um, one of the things about these these, these the, you know the controversy controversy and the social tensions that have emerged they've very much mm -hmm. coincided with the rise of social media as well and this opening up of space for you know contesting voices, um, you know, and also for viewpoints and uh, also unverified interpretations to travel quite fast as well. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I think that there's um, one, one thing I think that I, I without um, seeking to detract from the fact that the uh, Larunga and uh, particularly its uh, foremost leaders uh, do have um, an, in, an inordinate amount of social power vis-a-vis -vis certain pockets of Eastern Tibetan society. In some ways to construe the situation as uh, the Larung leaders mandating vegetarianism and thus sort of, you know, putting the, the nail in the coffin of nomadic culture, I think is a very simplistic re um, reading of in fact, how social movements work, how affect takes over society, how people at all levels get on board with a particular project and just how compelling um, for a number of reasons, this project of of um, a religiously informed Tibetan identity, piety, virtue, and animal-centered practices of, of um, compassion have been over the last few years. So um, perhaps I, I, I think that, um, you know, with the full course of time that it would be really interesting to see um, scholarship emerge that uh, unpacks that in a little bit more subtlety, again, without taking away from the fact that clearly we have a situation where um, strong and authoritative religious voices do have a very strong impact. Yeah, 
No, that's great. Thank you. And and to keep in mind, there are so many other forces at play here, social, political, economic forces, particularly um, forcing nomads, you know, um, into cities and into urban areas. Um, and I think that this needs to be part of the conversation as well. So I'm going to turn now to um, some questions from the audience. We have a few more minutes as, um, on the topic here of animal welfare. And one that arises, um, just kind of a softball pitch to you, Jeff, knowing your work, is uh, are there any Tibetan literary sources that justify meat eating as a basic reality not to be necessarily looked down upon? So they justify uh, meat eating. Um... Surprisingly few. Um, mm. The my read on that, there the closest and most significant that I can think of comes uh, from the work of Kedrup J. Um, and yeah, not to shamelessly self promote, but uh, a translation of that was included in a, um, a volume of translations that I edited a couple of years ago. Um, where Kedrupe argues explicitly that for monastics, uh, eating meat is acceptable. Um, for most of the uh, the texts that I that I'm familiar with, and uh, I am would actually really love to see more pro meat arguments. If anybody knows of them, please feel free to send them my way. Um, but most of the texts that I've looked at seem to sort of take as a given that people are going to eat meat. And that position doesn't seem mm -hmm. to require a lot of argumentation, at least formal argumentation. It's the opposite. It's the side that where the argumentation comes in are the people who are arguing against the norm and against the standard in support of vegetarianism. And so you will sometimes see these texts in support of vegetarianism um, create, you know, saying, oh, some people say, you know, that I'm a, you know, I practice Tantra, so therefore I should eat meat all the time. But that's not, a, you know, and then they'll say, but that's not a good interpretation of Tantra, right? But it's also impossible to know, how, like, is that a real argument out there? Or is that a, a straw man, right? Just something created by the pro-vegetarian author of that particular text. Um, and so my sense is that the, the meat eating majority probably did didn't feel a strong need to justify their practice. It was just what was done, right? right. Um, so, but again, if anyone out there knows of those texts, please do feel free to uh, to let me know because that would be more sources like that would be really awesome. Yeah, and just um, to mention, as you did, the, the Faults of Meat, which is Jeff's compilation of translations um, on this literature of eat, uh, yeah, meat eating and vegetarianism in Tibet. It's um, a great source for these kinds of issues. So Kat, is there anything else you'd like to, to add on this topic at large or um, uh, any thoughts I, I, on that? Yeah, I, I was actually just thinking in, in, in relation to vegetarianism that from a normative Buddhist point of view, um, and I think this is something that uh, Kempel Tsujinlodru sets out um, quite clearly in his uh, in his first essay on uh, uh, vegetarianism that um, I translated for Jeff's book, that from a normative Mahayana point of view, there is no defense for eating meat. If you want to sort of, you know, in terms of in terms of the normative stance of the Buddhist tradition on it, you know, that's what it is. Um, and it's interesting when I, uh, you know, talk to Tibetans in Tibetan areas who uh, feel a bit uh, ambivalent about the present situation, most of them do preface their remarks by saying, well, come on, you know, lamas can't obviously go and advocate meat eating, can they? So I think what's kind of interesting about this present movement is that, and I think it's, I think it's, you know, I think it's, um, again, I think it's, 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 it's too simplistic to totally blame Larun Ka, but what I think what's happened is you've all maybe always had, there's been a normative position which says eating meat is not good, okay? Um, uh, but uh, in terms of like really enforcing that on people and sort of, you know, creating mechanisms and, and peer pressure and local communities and movements and all of that sort of thing, that really hasn't been there. And so people have been able to exist. There's been 
room for them to uphold a normative ethic on the one hand, but also deal with the reality of their life, which falls short of that ethic. And of course, within Buddhist society, there are mechanisms for people to, you know, assuage their, 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 their negative karma that they accrue by doing these uh, behaviors which fall short of the normal normative ethic which life liberation is a perfect example of you know you make up for your debt of killing through liberating lives um, and so I think sort of what we see in a recent time is a really narrowing of that sort of space to kind of you know um, yeah just basically to hold up um, an ideal and essentially on the one hand then sort of live a, a normal life that falls short in so many ways and I think that's where um, attention emerges. That's great. And it really situates the whole movement in um, Buddhist ethics in conversation with real contemporary political and, and social life. With that, um, I'm going to pivot to our, our second um, topic here and bring and invite, in fact, Pema Tso and, and Sarah Jacoby into conversation about gender equity, um, inequality, and women's voices at Larangar and in Tibet more broadly. So with that, Pemet, so I'll turn to you first. And could you tell us a little bit about this journal, Gunkar Lamo journal that's published by the nuns um, at Larangar and, and give us some sort of background as far as this journal in particular. Thank you, um, Michael. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a very nice to be here uh, with all of you. And my research is concerned gender equality issue, specifically uh, the nuns in Narunkar, um, like uh, their improved education and increased standards and opportunities and the resultant writing and uh, publications. In my earlier research, I covered the major transformation of the of the educational system and opportunities for nuns. Uh, in short, uh, Campbell Jimmy Pinto has a version and give, give his full support to provide equal education opportunity for nuns from early uh, 1990s. The writing and uh, subsequent publications by the nuns are uh, uh, direct. Um, expression of this. Gangalamo is the first Tibetan journal for nuns. It is an important um, example of Tibetan women's awakening to their potations to engage in social action since its first edition in, in 2011. Uh, the journal has continued to be annually published or articles are uh, written by Tibetan women in both poetry and uh, prose. The reading of their writing covered such topic as their hometown, their hopes, their studies, uh, missing their mother and the women's issue in general. Um, the, jour the journal was founded by, by Camel Busong children, who um, initially did all of the work by herself for three years. Then Campbell Sodaji and Campbell Tsuchen Lodru noticed the importance of her work and supported her from 2014 and on. When I interviewed the Kamu Kusong children in 2018, I asked her why she published the journal. She stated in, journal, in journal name, there were not many journals for women's writing. And in particular, this journal focused on writing by Tibetan nuns. I thought that if I do this work, it will improve nice writing by editing a journal, journal each year. I felt that it would help nice writing and their writing would be, could be published as books in the future. And she also told me if we as Tibetan women wish to 
elevate our standards, uh, we must have knowledge and engage in action. For that reason, um, establish the journal Ganga Lama shoes, the awakening of feminist consciousness among Tibetan women and uh, clear engagement in um, recovering their voice through social action. That's great. Thank you so much, Pimitso. And in the volume, uh, you have two chapters. One that uh, you contribute, and the second in um, collaboration with, with Sarah Jacoby. So, Sarah, turning to you, can you tell us a little bit about this? I mean, it's really a fantastic anthology um, of women's writings that's come out of Larangar, this Kandro Chudzu Chimo. And, um, you know, I, I was thrilled when it when it came out. And I know many of us who study Tibetan literature were just sort of enamored by it. And, and now we have it starting to come into English and in, in your chapter here. Could you tell us a, a bit about this anthology? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Michael, for that great question and also for the enthusiasm behind it. Um, <laughs> I agree. Many of us felt um, and still feel. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Holly Gailey for including um, me here today and in the book. Um, and thank you, Michael, for being a leading guide along the symposium project. Um, I want to point out that my participation here um, and my research here is collaborative and it has been um, Padmatso and I together who've been speaking of voices. We've been doing a whole lot of listening to um, the Larungar nuns. Um, through interviews and really paying attention to their words and thinking about their impact. Um, and as we think about the voices that Larongar represents, I think turning to the Khandro Chudzu Chemo or the Dakini's Great Dharma Treasury is an excellent venture because it shows what a group of Larongar nuns think is important um, in terms of representing voices. And those voices are, um, in fact, the largest compilation ever of um, women's voices in the Tibetan language. Um, the compilation or anthology has includes 53 volumes. It's gigantic. Um, and it's not only the largest, but it's also arguably the first ever compilation. These, this same group of nuns published a 16 volume version of this back in 2013. So I guess that would technically be the first um, non-sectarian religious oriented volume that is, that is organized around the principle of women, um, which is a social category you don't find as an organizing principle in anthologies before this period. So there's something distinctive about that. Um, so we talked to the group of nuns who um, formed an editorial committee that is called the Arya Tare Book Association. Um, it started in 2011 with seven nuns. Um, by 2018, there were 11 nuns. Most of them were Kenmos themselves. They started this work of collecting um, material to publish in this anthology. Uh, on they, they describe it as a side project. Uh, they were Their main project was doing work at Larangar and taking classes. And this was just a kind of side thing that they weren't getting paid for. There was no money involved. They were just trying to um, do this on their own. So they traveled widely throughout Tibet. They asked mo at monasteries in different places and libraries um, around Tibet if there were any copies of women's writings. Um, they described this as a painstakingly difficult, challenging project. Um, they compare it to what they describe as Lama's writings. And by that, they mean prominent male religious figures' writings. As, as very different because it wasn't a pro project that involved reprinting, but rather um, 
collecting very, very limited manuscript versions, some of which were archaic in spelling or not complete and really having to puzzle through the material. So a lot of spade work was involved. Um, and then they talk about having to teach themselves how to type as well and having to get computers. So they really had to start from square one, which makes it all the more incredible how extensive their publications have ended up um, in only the space of one decade. Um, so what is in these 53 volumes? Uh, there's a table of contents um, that doesn't even include everything, but just gives you a gist in the chapter that Padmatso and I wrote, the last one called Lessons from Buddhist Foremothers. Um, and so you can get a little bit more of a sense of who's in this um, from the written version. But in short, about half of it is biographies by and about Buddhist women. And by Buddhist women, I mean Indian, like the first uh, eight volumes are South Asian women and Dakinis. So we're crossing the barrier between human and divine here completely um, as we talk about this category of womanhood that's represented um, or the feminine. And so then the, the, the second big chunk of these 53 volumes is um, religious teachings um, and some full sungbums or collected works of um, women uh, and these include, I don't have time to go through all the names. These include, I would say, some of your um, most famous women, right? There's Yishi Tsogyal and Machi Ladrun and, um, and so on, but there are also some much more rare women's voices in here. Um, so there are over 200 women represented in the volumes. Um, and I think, one of the things that really came up for Parmatso and I was um, why did they publish this? First of all, why now? Why organize it this way? What are their motivations? Um, and one of the ways to look at that is to look at the preface that they've written. Um, and that's what we've translated in the chapter in Voices from Lorongar. Um, so that gives you a sense. Uh, and another way is to ask them. So we've really done a lot of listening as well. Um, so I just want to read one quotation um, that says something about their motivations. Um, our objective is for the global readership in general and for our Tibetan girls in particular, not to think we are women and consider ourselves inferior on account of differences between men and women that are based on a few biased, outdated customs of male superiority and female inferiority, which have been tossed aside as merely bygone history or based on a few differences in physical strength, right? But how do you really feel? You know, this is a very powerfully worded um, comment about this outdated, biased, bygone understanding of male superiority and female inferiority, which in conversation with them, they described a lot, um, uh, like this pochok momen gdawa, the view that men are superior and women are inferior. And this is what they seek to, um, to reject or make sure that it is fully rejected as it is an element of bygone history. Um, this sounds like a very feminist resonant discourse, right? The more we asked about feminism or women's rights, um, something like that, um, the more they resisted that. So I wanna just caution that this is not the same thing as a kind of Western liberal rights-based discourse. So we need to do more work to think about what equality means for these nuns. Um, and that involves really careful listening and not assuming that we know exactly um, that we're making direct correlations um, between what we mean by feminism and um, these nuns. They were very careful about saying what was important to them is um, we're not all about empty talk. You want to dispute, you can dispute till the yaks come home about. Um, gender equality, we're about taking action. 
So this is important to them. And I would describe the Chandra Chudza Chemo as one of the key signature actions that they have performed. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Sarah, that's great. And um, to put it into this broader conversation about feminism and, and, and so many ideas that um, are not Tibetan in origin. Um, Pema, so I wanna turn back to you and, and bring you into this conversation about uh, the education that the nuns are receiving at Larangar and um, the kinds of uh, learning that they're undertaking and, and the kinds of training that they're undertaking. Could you talk to us a little bit about the education of the nuns, please? Um, okay, so thank you. Um, for this research, I did almost more than more than ten years, and uh, the develop of the camo system um, has has um, has grow up the Snowy and Snowy, and I think uh, there are the three main main process like uh, the initial um, trans transformation of camo system that uh, during during the camp um time and then after that we can we can see the re, uh, reforming uh, the camo system um, that uh, by some of the campus uh, for example campus Tenlo do support the um, the camo teaching and also made the um, uh, the exam for Tibetan nuns to get the degree. So I, I have the number in front of me, but I think we, I, I don't have time to see the which year have, have how many have how many camels or some this um, yeah I not need to say about that. Then uh, we can see the improvement of the and also reformment of the camels uh, system. Um, this uh, is more, more about the curricul curriculum and the exam, the, the, stand, the standing, the standardizing the exams and the curricul of, curriculum of camels after 2013. Um, the academic uh, environment changed uh, specifically, and nice classes will move formal, uh, formal tests uh, to the new education building. They moved to the new education building without with about the sixty classroom. Uh, the education, the educational requirements for nuns become clear and uh, for and uh, fourth life. The mass, the mass opportunity to study the Dharma with, uh, with uh, female teachers uh, appeared and uh, study increased because of the, uh, yeah, not of the camels. Yeah. Thank you, Pema. So yeah, and the camels is the title that they receive for this academic degree, right? So yeah. this is really unprecedented or um, of little precedent, most likely, um, to have this. And Larangar seems to be at the forefront of, of conferring these degrees to, to educated women scholars, right? Yes. Um, in the history, yeah. we have Campbell, um, the title for, for who can teach um, Dharma in monastery. So um, now we have Camel, yeah? We have Camel right. in in, in our monastic teachings. So that is very important. Um, and uh, for their writing, I also have a one, uh, one quote uh, to see what the camel's writing, the article I translate the way forward for you and me uh, is in that uh, Ganga Lamo journal um, about the women's rights and uh, also uh, the article in decades and um, awareness of gender equality issues uh, in Narunka. Um, 
So um, the coach is uh, in particularly uh, in this article, I wanted to point out that many Tibetans think that our women generally don't have knowledge and uh, understanding if a child is a girl when she is young, her parents not only want, won't support her to study, but they will even forbid her from getting on an education. So the e education opportunity as well as their shifting awareness and their hard work um, has resulted in the, in the publishing uh, all of that. Uh, Sarah and I work together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Primato. So I'd like to just take one question from the audience, and I really encourage um, the audience to add questions in the Q and A and and bump them up with the uh, with the thumb. And it, it's really sort of towards you, Sarah, and because uh, you discussed this Kondro Chuds and Chemo. The question is, how many copies were published, and and how widely distributed is it, and in particular what's the accessibility to, um, to this publication inside Tibet? Um, we, we discussed this with the nuns um, and Padmatso in a minute. I will just warn you, I'm going to pivot to you and see if you can remember the exact number that the nuns said, because we do have interview data on the number. And it was in the ballpark of a couple of thousand, but I have to confess, I don't remember the precise number, um, uh, the initial print run that is. Um, we did ask extensively about who this writing is really for. Um, and the, the nuns we spoke with described it as um, for people in general, but in particular for Tibetan women. Um, and so they intend it for um, not just nuns, but also um, lay women to get a sense of the value of women in Tibetan history. And that value is tangible when you can pick up a book and read about it like you can for the um, incredible value of Lama's religious teachings in their words, meaning um, male religious specialists. Um, they were the the nuns who um, who arranged this volume. These volumes were very careful about saying we are not in business. This is not some kind of printing house. We're not trying to make money. We don't sell our books in bookstores. There's you. you that's not how it works. Um, they have given large numbers of these books and they're very beautiful. I have one right in front of me at like leather, you know, very high quality publication. Um, they've sent them all around the world um, and they, they, do, um, they do give them or sell them for the amount of money they cost to print, right? But not to um, earn an income from it. Um, to people in the area. Um, Panmatso, do you want to add more about whether you remember the specific number of the print run and more about um, how far these books have extended in Tibet now? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, um, the, the first, um, the first, the 13 volumes, they published about part of the 1,000, uh, 1,000, and the second, the second, the 14, the 17th, um, it's about, it's also about probably a few thousand, but uh, then they published uh, more than the first volumes. Um, so, so for the, for the, um, for the interview of them, um, I brought my students go to there, and uh, also the first time we talked with a group of the assistant, the association of the Ariyachara, the, the group of the nuns. 
So uh, we have a lot of the recorders and about uh, the books, the, the, after they publish the books, uh, where they will send, like uh, um, they told us they will give to the monastery. Um, they, they gathered the information for the writings. And uh, for the second uh, volume, uh, they send those values to universities uh, in the West. And also um, they gave some scholars um, for research. Um, they also have some, uh, still have some. I saw, I took pictures 2018, and I also talked with the camel. Who, uh, who is the actor? So we, uh, I know we still have some, but my one student doing the research um, in in Qinghai, and she asked the Mandarin to the uh, to read uh, those books, but some of them they they don't know about this this uh, this those books. So that is uh, we. I think the uh, the reader is still not widely. Okay, um, I want to make sure that um, Michael Sheehy has a few minutes here as well. Um, I am just going to say really briefly. I saw in the Q and A one other question about are the Larungar nuns being influenced by Western feminism in this project. And I want to resist that um, and also invite you to read an article that Padmatso and I recently published that, that deals with that more fully called Gender Equality in and on Tibetan Nuns Terms, published in Religions in the Fall. Um, and um, they describe it really as coming from Buddhist principles. So that, that's a brief answer to that. Um, and without further ado, Michael, um, can you tell us a little bit about how Western science is being engaged inside Tibet? Um, and what is this new science of rebirth that Kempo Tsutum Lodro writes about in his work that you translate in this chapter? Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, this, um, the phrase new science, Senrig Sarwa is, is a phrase that he uses in this, um, in this work that he wrote um, based on talks that he had given and, and ideas that have been formulated over some time. And, and I translate some excerpts here. And it's really kind of part of this sort of longer trajectory of, um, I wouldn't say secularism, I'd really say normative Western science. And, and they make a distinction or a distinction that is at least sort of inherent in the discourse. And the interest here is really, again, Buddhism engaging science, normative Western science, and a dialogue between Buddhism and science. Um, this has emerged over the last 30 years since the late 1980s um, as part of a kind of major trend of Buddhist engagements with modernity outside of Tibet. But we see precursors to this um, dating all the way back really to the early 18th century, where we have um, texts coming through Beijing on Jesuit astrology that Tibetans are translating and, and thinking about um, all through the you know, 19th century. There's all this, several discourses about the geography and how the world is conceived and um, issues around um, you know, astronomy and, and geography in particular are of interest to Tibetan intellectuals all the way up through the, the 20th century. And we have this figure named Gendon Chupal who um, was a, a modernist by nature, or uh, not by nature, who was very much a modernist. And, and he goes abroad and, and he writes back to Tibetans about science and um, publishes some articles while abroad uh, in India on science and the idea of the world being round, not flat, and so forth. And these sort of set the stage for a broader discourse, even though um, some of what Gendon Chopal wrote wasn't received in Tibet until 
um, until after his passing, until after his life. But nonetheless, there's um, a kind of discourse emerging around science. And Kempo Sutram Lodro's work fits very much in this, um, in these patterns that we see. In particular, his work, it's called The Mirror That Illuminates Existence, an analysis of past and future lives. It's kind of exemplary of Tibetan seeking alliance with modern science. And we have other examples, and, and this is one, and it, it's of note um, for several reasons. And it, I think it's particularly interesting on um, several fronts and hits different registers of, of interest in this sort of broader dialogue or dialectic, really, between Buddhism and science. In particular, it's about rebirth. It's about past lives. It's not about something that's necessarily empirically discernible, right? This isn't a conversation about, about materialism or, or um, even sort of brain functions or you know, neural correlates. This is actually about um, a fundamental tenet of Tibetan Buddhism, but one that is arguably um, you know, non-scientifically or non-empirically discernible. And yet he takes this, um, Kempo Sutram Lodro takes this um, literature that he reads on out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences from the work of Raymond Moody and Ian Stevenson, who David Germano had mentioned um, earlier, who's at the University of Virginia and did a whole host of work on interviews based on interviews, first-person reports and, and accounts of these kinds of experiences, outer body experiences and near death experiences, and comes uh, to formulate a kind of theory around rebirth. And in particular, um, he, you know, Ian Stevenson does. And Kempo Sutram Lodro comes to, to read this material through the Chinese translations and writes this incredible essay in which he brings this research um, from the American psychological literature based on first person reports um, into conversation with Tibetan Buddhist literature in particular uh, explicitly with the Tibetan uh, Book of the Dead, the Bharata Todro. And he compares these initial stages of dying from these first person reports with descriptions of dying and the dying process as found in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And in so doing, he argues, Kempo Sutram Lodro argues for a scientific validation of rebirth. And as part of this broader conversation on Buddhism and science, it, it makes this very important move in my mind to recenter uh, the conversation about metaphysical issues that they're not, um, only about uh, explicitly empirical issues, but um, they're also about issues that are reported from experience, from per first person experience, and to sort of bring Buddhism into the conversation with science, uh, so-called take the brackets off of some of these topics, such as rebirth, um, you know, enlightenment, karma, there's a whole set of metaphysical, what we might call metaphysical claims and ideas and that are doctrinally um, grounded within Buddhism that have sort of been off the table in conversation with science. And what's remarkable about this piece in particular is that he, he puts that back on the table in a very kind of square and, and centric way and says, no, uh, this is studied, this has been studied, this can be studied. And this is our literature, um, making reference particularly to the, the Bardo Tojra literature that has resonances and can be used um, as ways to sort of uh, analytically model some of these ideas. So it's sort of from someone, uh, an intellectual Tibetan inside Tibet, it's, it's actually a remarkable piece of literature. But uh, with that, in noticing we have about 15 minutes left, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot to questions. So please put questions that um, you'd like for any of our participants and, and panelists in the Q&A, and I'll read through the ones that, um, that come to the top. So 
So we have a question here about um, Well, we have several questions again, back to you, Pematso and, and Sarah, about the readership of the, these compilations of women's writings and kind of a question about women in Tibet, um, not only having access to these writings, but, but reading them and, and the kind of influence among women in Tibet. Sarah or, or Pematso, could you talk a little bit about this? <laughs> You're muted. I, I, um, I think you, you first, please. You first, please. Uh, mm. Yeah, please, Pematso, please. Um, So um, Michael, can you tell me? Yeah, just the question I'll summarize is about um, women in Tibet reading and having access to this collection of women's writings, the the Kundra Yeah. Um, so um, in in Narungpa, I met uh, many nuns and camels um, for them. Uh, they they think for for nuns for nuns they think they have those models in front of them so they want to study more and they want to become an a camel um, or practice more and like those um, those um, like uh, Ishi Koja and uh, Madilagin. They want to become like a good practitioner and they become a camel. So we encourage them. Emma, so I'm going to ask you to lean forward. We can barely hear you. Maybe closer to your microphone, please. Oh, oh okay. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think um, many nuns told me Many nice told me um, the, those folks encouraged them um, to study more, to learn more Dharma, and uh, to practice more. So they want to uh, become uh, camels, and they also uh, have the Ishi Koja and the Majilari in front of them, and their story encouraged them to, to study hard. Yeah, for me, I think I will. Um, and I just want to um, add to that. That's that's the impression I got as well. I would say it that in this way, maybe that you can only become something that you've heard of. And so the idea is to present um, a myriad array of different models of what it means to be accomplished as a woman um, so that um, women, um, Tibetan mothers and their daughters, using their words, um, who are um, who inherit this history can choose the version, the model of um, secular ethics or religious um, lifestyle that is right for their time and place. These are the kinds of expressions that they use. That's great. And, you know, I've heard similar things said about just reading the Namtar literature. It opens up the imagination to the possibilities that you can emulate and, and mimic, right? There's a kind of mimicry happening that, as you say, you can only become what you can imagine. Um, there's a Another question here, again, for, for you, Pematso and Sarah, any comments on feminine or really, pardon, female academic excellence existing in both Larangar and Yarchen um, having sort of earlier precedents? In other words, were there earlier precedents um, to this academic excellence for women? Okay, so 
for Yakin, um, I know um, uh, a little bit about the Yakin, and I also doing the compare the Yakin and the uh, Larun Kara. What is the difference between the two two monastery or two schools? Um, so the main sense for the Yachin, they they uh, they also have ten more title, um, but ten more teaching about the practice, more about the Zopa Chenbo. Zopa Chenbo, yeah. Um, in Narunka, ten more teaching the Yung Bo De Nga the Dharma, yeah? They more talk about the Dharma, the Yung Bodhinga's books. So uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, in Yarqin, it's like a uh, Rukja. And in Narunkar, uh, they, they, they are more like Shijia, but they also have, have the practice uh, class. Now that, uh, that the number is less than uh, nuns who study Yung Bo um, Yeah, this is the main difference, I think. Yeah, but I, uh, I did the, the, the research in Yarqin uh, 2000, start 2007. So um, they have camels there. But more teach about Zogba Chenbo, teach about the practice. Um, sometimes they teach one by one, like give some manga um, to Ishi Lama. And in Narunka, it's different, yes. So, Sarah, do you want to say something? I think there are other examples in history of. Um, of nunneries that had strong education systems like Shuksep nunnery, for instance. Um, and I think we also can't ignore the non-monastic lineages of practice and study that um, women have been a part of for many, many centuries. So it, it's not the case that education is completely new or that it's, it's purely modern, but on the scale that you find it um, in Larongar or Yachengar, it is modern. Antonio, you have something to say. Yeah, Antonio, please. Yes, uh, hi. Um, I want to add that one thing, I've been in Yachengar many times <clears throat> and uh, I've seen a, a a more recent, uh, recent means in the you know past ten years, not really last year, but let's say um, last time I was there in the uh, two thousand and I don't know was it fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. I've I've seen um, a, a very new attention to a sign of vocational um, kind of interests and disciplines, including photography and um, and cinematography. Um, I think many Chinese donors have donated beautiful, amazing um, uh, cameras and video cameras. And the campus there have uh, opened uh, some classes on, on that. And so I've seen exams. I've seen exams of nuns showing um, documentaries that they made in Tibetan and Chinese, some photos. Um, and, and I've seen actually the exam really in one of the temples there. So there's a, also that that is a bit different than, than Larungar. Uh, there's an attention to some practical uh, disciplines that the nuns can use uh, for many other purposes. I don't know exactly what, but there is uh, that element to, to, to be added. And I find it very, very new. That's great. I've seen other trends in places like Zongsar and Zamtang uh, in similar skills training based education. Um, I'd like to open up now a question that comes, I think it's for everyone. And I think it's sort of um, hits at the heart, strikes at the heart of this project here. And I'll paraphrase. The question is, how can we tell the story of Larangar and its significance to the international community and the influence um, that these leaders have and that they're having? So it's really a question about 
the stories, the narratives that are emerging, how can they be told? This book itself is called Voices from Larangar. And I just open that up as a way for us all to sort of chime in, whomever likes to, within these um, last few minutes here. What? I can say yeah, one Antonio, thing. Please. <laughs> I can say one yeah, thing. Um, I wrote a dissertation on on uh, Larungar and the other Gars, and uh, if, uh, let's say if Padma Sambhava helps really well, I might be able to find a, a more focused time and finish the book that I'm writing about the history and uh, kind of political history rather of of these. Uh, of four of the four major gars, the Chogars, uh, which include Lungongar, Yachingar, Nielungar, and Larungar, using Larungar as a kind of a matrix, uh, really, uh, with the background of the Panchen Rinpoche and the policies of the 80s. So, and my approach, based also what you heard before, is that of contextualizing in what I think really is uh, the 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 framework that allowed and kind of pushed for this type of activities to emerge and blend in with traditional interests. So my answer to that question is to um, uh, be sure that the context the and the nuances of the modernities we are interested in, in unveiling in this phenomenon is done in a way that uh, kind of pay and honors um, the agencies of the Tibetan and historical context that allowed this phenomena to emerge uh, the way it is yeah. even today. Thanks so much, Antonio, and, and your work is exemplary because it's so ethnographic as well as bringing the textual work into it. Holly, uh, I'll turn to you. Is there anything you liked? You've been so deeply immersed in this project. And Thank you, Michael. Well, I think there's so many different ways to um, tell a story, but one of the ways to tell the story is about Kempo Jigme Punsok's enormous impact and about how his successors have been continuing his legacy. And my own contribution to Voices from Larangar is a translation of an, ex an excerpt from his 1995 work, Hard Advice to Tibetans for the 21st Century. And so many of the themes that we've been talking about today really are crystallized already, at least in, in part there. Um, his interest in presenting a kind of rational, disworldly kind of uh, modern Buddhism, the, his interest in, you know, sort of um, looking at um, Buddhism and science, his enormous interest in ethical reform, and um, particularly how ethical reform and Tibetan identity are sort of interwoven so that, so that ethical reform becomes a kind of returning to some essential um, compassionate aspect of Buddhism that then is um, you know, coextensive with uh, Tibetanness. So a lot of identity um, promotion and valorization of Tibetan identity um, and its incredible history as a response to um, some of the state discourse on, on minorities and as backward, etc. And so, um, and he's also um, laying the seeds for uh, animal rights in his uh, 2000, um, speech that is a request to all Tibetan men and women to give up, um, you know, to renounce uh, slaughtering, you know, selling animals for slaughter. And so there's so many seeds of what we're seeing today. And of course, his um, tremendous interest in promoting uh, nuns' education. So we're seeing so much of that um, flower um, in what all of the other panelists have presented and um, contributed to this volume. So. That's another way to tell the story. Um, and I think important just to remember how much his legacy looms large there. And, um, and of course his, uh, his niece, um, Getsun Mon Mumso is also an embodied presence of that um, at Larangar. But I'd also like to hear from Kat as, as we close, if you have any, another way to tell the story. We heard about context from Antonio and, and sort of waxing glowingly about the founder, but um, what might you add? 
unmute myself. Um, yeah, I guess I would maybe go back to what Nico said at the beginning of, of this symposium, and that is that uh, an increasing number of teachings and publications by the uh, vo the voices of Lavrangar themselves are being increasingly made in, available in English and other languages. So whilst perhaps, and actually to be quite honest with even though uh, uh, the subject of many of these publications are, uh, are Dharma teachings, I mean, that is the genre, uh, there's also, you know, there's also quite a lot of um, meta discourse and description and, um, and, and much told about the history of La Rongaya and its lore and its, um, its, its, its rituals and, um, you know, even its sacred landscape and things like this are, are revealed in many of these publications that are now being av uh, made available in English. And so I think that in many ways, uh, the ability for English speaking audiences to really gain access to that uh, speech world directly is improving. Not to mention websites, right? The, the, the Kimbo Sodarje website uh, is also not, quite... That's not particularly... Oh, well, no, there isn't... Right, the, yeah, English, is... the foreign hosted one is still yeah. up and running. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I meant is that it's very rich also in different type of uh, essays that cover many aspects of, uh, of Lavangar history and some of the ideas, the campus and Kempo Jimmy himself, himself. That's very interesting. Yeah, I actually, and I just add to that, that they, I think that um, Campbell Sordaji in particular, I think the um, his team of close uh, Chinese monastic volunteers and lay volunteers have actually been very active in telling that story, because in some ways they have been involved in really making that story legible to a Chinese speaking um, population. So they've actually been involved in translating that world from, uh, well, it's a Tibetan world that's mediated to them through their Chinese teachers, and then making that available to a wider audience and now increasingly translating it into other the languages. So I think you're right, Antonio, that that's um, an interesting place to look. All right. Well, that's a wonderful note to end on. And I want to just um, thank all our panelists um, tonight um, for sharing your perspectives and as well reiterate our thanks to co-sponsors, the Tibet Himalaya Initiative, and which is housed at the Center for Asian Studies here at CU Boulder. Um, and I particularly wanna thank, thank Liza, um, who's in the background um, making this Zoom webinar possible. And then our co-sponsor, um, the UVA Tibet Center, and also Shambhala Publications. So um, really wonderful conversation um, about um, this incredibly important Buddhist institution, um, some of the works and writings and speeches of um, the Kenmos and Kempos. And um, thank you all for, for your work to help bring um, their voices um, from Larangar uh, to English speaking or English reading audiences. So thanks everybody for joining us tonight. And um, Please feel free to uh, uh, get the volume, and I feel like somebody should put the URL in the um, in the uh, chat, but I don't have it handy. So if anybody does and wants to chat it to everyone, otherwise I will put it uh, in an email to everybody registered, along with how to access the recordings. So thank you all, and take care. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>